Welcome to Building My Legacy Podcast. This podcast is designed for leaders and entrepreneurs who want to leave a legacy and will provide strategies that focus upon key elements for legacy creation, determining your desired impact and its benefit, increasing your legacy's reach by engaging key stakeholders, planning, prioritizing, and executing. Here's your host, Dr. Lois Sonstegard. Welcome, everybody, to Building My Legacy podcast. Today, I have with me Jeff Cook. Jeff is fascinating because he comes out of Harvard, and he is a serial entrepreneur. And so those of us who have entrepreneurial ship in our blood, I think he will speak to you um, a great deal today. And he has, I think, addressed needs and issues in the marketplace in many different ways which I think is also interesting for today's time because so many people right now are looking for what's next. How do I transition? How do I do things Um, again? And so just to give you a sense of his background, he has been CEO uh, of Que Pasa and My Yearbook. He has bought and sold that company. What you, You bought it back and sold it again. And um, he's taken the company from beginning stages to uh, being a very profitable company. So I want him to share a little bit about what brought him to doing what he's doing and the companies and also that entrepreneurial journey that he's been on, how he's approached it and lessons he's learned that he can share with us. Great. Well, I appreciate uh, being on the show. This is uh, very nice, and uh, I'd love to answer any questions you have. Okay, so let's start with being an entrepreneur. It takes a special kind of mindset. You started that while you were still in at college at the university at Harvard, and you did it out of need to just generate income, and you didn't want a job job where you were reporting to somebody else. So just tell me, how did you get started and how you use that learning to go to the next level? Sure. So, uh, yeah, I went to, uh, I, I grew up in New Jersey, middle of New Jersey, South Plainfield High School, um, and went to Harvard. Uh, it must have been uh, 96. Um, I never really thought of myself as an entrepreneur um, back then. I I, uh, thought maybe I'd be a scientist or or something like that. Um, Quickly learned that um, there's a lot better physicists than me at Harvard. And, um, and, but I did need a job. And so, um, you know, I was going to, I thought about working at a library. Um, I didn't particularly want to clean my classmates toilets. Um, And so I thought, well, what are the types of things I can do? Now, again, this is 96, 90, this is actually 97. When I started thinking about it, it was my sophomore year. And um, I thought, well, I could edit. Um, I thought I was a good writer at the time. Um, And so I decided, well, let me just offer my services online. And so I took a cash advance of $600 against my credit card, started a a little editing business. I figured um, the worst case scenario would be that no one would use it. And um, I would have learned how to create a website and integrate an e-commerce backend, uh, which at the time, you know, wasn't... um, something you could just get off the shelf. And so um, that was, uh, I thought I'd learned something and uh, lo and behold, people started ordering stuff. And so um, it was a perfect little side job for me um, in uh, at Harvard th- that year. Um, and, and I would tinker with the website, try to improve it, learn about search engine marketing, grew that ultimately to millions of dollars of revenue um, before I would sell it a couple of years after I graduated. But you know, by senior year, I was making three or $400,000, and I was hiring editors uh, because I, I could no longer do all the work. So out of that experience, Jeff, what were your biggest learnings? I mean, that was very early in your life. What were some of the biggest learnings that you took away from that experience? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think you got to begin, right? So, So I think the main thing I took out of that is, um, that was a story all about just beginning, right? So um, I had an idea. Um, I didn't necessarily think it was a big idea. I just thought it was a little side job. 
and the trick was actually building it, right? So having the, the uh, initiative to just go do it um, and then continue to tinker with it, which um, is apparently something that I, I was reasonably good at. And so um, I think the, the lesson I learned is that, you know, there, especially when you're that young, um, as I was 19 or so, you know, there's just no downside to fail, like a business failure at 19, right? Like, um, there isn't a downside to failure. Like, even if the thing were to have failed, you would have learned from that experience. It's, it's a totally different thing to have a successful job and then say, well, I'm going to quit that to go do something else, despite my three children and mortgage, right? So, so, you know, being um, a college student, being, you know, young, I thought was a, was an advantage. Um, and then, uh, you, know, I, uh, you know, I, I went through that whole process, raising some money, um, selling the company ultimately to a, a fairly large uh, conglomerate. Um, and then, uh, you know, I would say I went through that whole withdrawal process too. You know, once you sell a company that you spent so much time with, um, you almost feel like you, you know, you lost, uh, your child. And so, um, you know, learn how to, how to manage that as well. How did you manage that? Loss is always difficult. You start something new. So, so I found that the, uh, the main thing that, that helped with that was, uh, start something new. So, so it was around the time I sold the company and exited it. Um, I started, three other companies. Uh, one was a, an admissions uh, college and university admissions uh, business called Insider Guides. Another was uh, an art business called artstudio.com. Um, and that, that would actually all, also have an art community called wetcanvas.com. Um, and, um, and, and then the while I was working those, on both of those. The purpose of those companies was what? So the purpose of Art Studio was to bring home an original. So was, the idea would be, you know, instead of having all these prints or whatever people put on their walls, um, to have an original artwork to connect artists, local artists, with uh, people who might want to buy, but around a price point that was lower than typical uh, art. So instead of you know buying something for two or three thousand dollars, you know, buying something for two or three hundred dollars. Um, and then Insider Guides was meant to replace college guidebooks, which at the time were kind of written by almost like, you know, professional writers and, and, and maybe by the universities themselves with kind of an insider perspective written by the students. Um, as I started doing some, uh, you know, uh, research on, on that, I, I, I realized there was a, a kind of a, another company called College Prowler at the time, who uh, was well positioned and seemed to be doing something very similar to what I wanted to do. Um, and, and, and so I, I didn't really uh, think that was valid. The art thing, um, I put some serious effort into. Uh, we acquired the wetcanvas.com art community. We imagined connecting that community who was basically original artists with buyers. Um, but at the same time, I uh, started a social network called uh, My Yearbook along uh, actually with my brother and sister at the time, still my brother and sister. And um, that uh, was, was kind of, uh, uh, that was meant, I was Facebook user, you know, 13,000 or something. Um, so I was, it was fairly early to, to Facebook. Um, and I thought social networking, I had this sense that social networking was gonna be massive. Um, I didn't necessarily imagine how massive, um, but I thought that there would be social networks for different things. and so. Um, Facebook seemed to be the friends and family one. Maybe you could have a social network for meeting new people, which is similar to dating, but maybe more casual, more like the bar, the coffee house vibe. And so that's, uh, that's where we started. And, um, that started kind of taking a, a mind of its own. It was clearly the most successful idea of the ones I had been working on. So I, I stopped doing everything else. And, and then I've been doing that for the last 16 years. Okay. So how does that work? How do you meet people that way? And how do you connect? So um, we, 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 well, today, the way it works is um, people T Today because join. of COVID or today in terms of No, 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 of today, today uh, meaning back in the, back then it was a website. Now, it, then it was a mobile app. And now it's kind of a, a live streaming mobile app. 
Um, so, so the way people meet kind of it changes with technology. Um, but what it was always about is just connecting to people near you uh, based on age, gender, uh, location, you know, people within 15, 20, 30 miles of you, um, uh, connecting around interests, connecting around, um, you know, things, you know, people that are mutually interested in each other's appearance potentially. Um, and so we uh, have made in the last four years a pretty substantial bet on marrying live streaming video with dating. And our live streaming video products um, we were, as far as I know, we're, we're like the first people to be doing this to uh, an English speaking audience. Um, it's something we have seen done in China um, by uh, the company uh, Momo. And Momo. so um, we, we took that concept, we applied it here, but we put our own spin on it. We created a mini dating game called, called Next Date, which is part of our Meet Me app. So we have five apps they all have more than four and a half million daily active users um meet me scout tagged um Lavu and growler and they each serve a different part of the dating landscape growler is a gay dating app meet me uh, and scout are kind of u.s oriented dating tags and african-american oriented dating Lavu's european dating and um but they all do more or less the same thing they, they connect people, sorry, they, they, they all do more or less the same thing. They connect people to each other um, around, um, around their interests, around their, their preferences. And by adding live streaming into the product, we found that we could grow um, dramatically by, by, by taking the same users we had, but taking, let's say, a quarter or 30% of them and getting another 20 minutes a day from them. Um, and so we've always imagined ourselves as the mobile version of the bar, the coffee house by adding live streaming, it made it feel more alive, like a very lively bar or coffee house. And, and it ultimately helped the product quite a bit. Um, and now, you know, now that we're in the age of, unfortunately in the age of uh, this virus, uh, we've seen, you know, people uh, increase their use of um, uh, the live streaming platform by more than 40% in just the last six weeks. By more than 40%. That's amazing. So people are desperate to connect. I mean, we know that from what we're seeing and reading elsewhere. And, um, and, and they're using this as a source for doing that. So tell me, live streaming, there's nothing about it that gets saved, correct? Or tell me, how right. does that work? Yeah, so the way uh, there's a couple different ways it works. So, so the the primary way is you have a, a streamer. Uh, so any user of the app can be a streamer on the app, and that streamer goes live by tapping the go live button, and then other viewers and anyone any other user of the app can can go view that stream, and the viewers can hit the like button. They to show that they you know appreciate the streamer. They can. Um, they can write in comments um, to, that the streamer can then answer in real time. So you might ask questions. A lot of people ask questions in the comments, and then the streamer can answer those questions. Um, or you know, the streamer, uh, the viewer can even ask to be a guest uh, streamer. So the, uh, the so that you're both both parties are streaming, and then everyone else is watching the conversation. Um, and then in addition, and, and what monetizes about it is you can give gifts. You can give uh, virtual gifts to the streamer. So any user, any viewer can give um, a virtual car or a virtual rose or a virtual kiss um, or any number of virtual items, dozens of virtual items. And these are just simple animations that go away after a few seconds. Um, but what's interesting about them is um, they convey um, some monetary benefit to the streamer. So it's a way of basically um, tipping the streamer. How does it convey monetary value? It's so, not real monetary value. So it's a per perceived value. So it's, it's actually real. So, so you ba basically you get um, some, uh, uh, so, so if, if I give you um, a $1 rose, you will actually have 30 cents, let's say. Um, and then you can, you know, cash, you can, you can basically claim some cash reward at some point once you reach some threshold. 
um, of, 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 dime, of, of kind of this, uh, this currency. And so um, it's, it, it's, it's basically tipping content producers. And what was interesting about that model, and it's something we, we saw first pioneered in um, China, but now you know, Facebook has something similar to that, and so does you know, certainly Twitch, um, Microsoft's Mixer. You know, so, so now it's, it's essentially in a lot of different places. Um, we, we applied it into this dating use case, and we found um, that you know, it's, it's actually not too different from kind of buying a drink at the bar you know, like if you think about a real world situation where you might want to meet someone at the bar, it would be a custom to, to go up there and maybe offer to buy a drink. Um, and here, you know, if you have a crowded dating platform and you want to stand out, giving a virtual rose separates you. It says like, look, I have a little disposable income. You know, I, I, I am willing to um, uh, show you that I'm interested in you. And it, it, it ends up that what, what you get is you also get this class of streamer who's actually a talented content producer who is almost like doing talk shows, like personality-driven talk shows, um, and some very successfully. And so you have this really interesting dynamic where you have maybe you know, a couple thousand streamers who are extremely talented um, and treat it almost like their full-time job and then you have this long tail of many hundreds of thousands of streamers who are just interested in meeting people and dating. And uh, you have this really vibrant community. And that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's basically what we found we have. So obviously you began this. And the, in over what period of time have you developed this? Um, so, so I started the company originally as my yearbook in 2005. Um, and, and so it's been over the last 15 years um, that we've been doing this. We've been doing live streaming since 2017. So only the last three or four years we started doing live streaming. We started building it in 2016. Okay. And, and live streaming is a big thing, right? Like it's not easy to build a live streaming platform. We've spent tens of millions of dollars, probably a year, you know, building out our solutions as they exist today. Um, you know, when we decided to go into live streaming, we saw it as an all-in bet of the company. And the reason is because, you know, it's not just building out the live streaming function. You have to build out significant moderation. You have to make sure that users aren't going to do bad things on your live streams. Not an easy problem um, to solve. Um, and, and so we've got, but then once we built it, we said, you know what, we, we've already made this all in company bet on live streaming video. Um, and so let's double down, let's triple down, let's, let's continue to move all in and, and let's apply this live streaming video solution to other apps that look like ours. Um, and so we started acquiring our competitors in 2017 at the same time as part of the same live streaming strategy. And we acquired these competitors and, we, um, and those, those include um, Scout, Tagged, uh, Lavu, Growler. Um, and, and so these other apps we acquired really just to add our live streaming solution to it. Um, and in each case, it was tremendously successful, growing revenues, you know, as by at least a quarter um, and as much as a half for that app. And so uh, very meaningful. And so um, from there, we said, well, look, we're, now we're very good at acquiring things and adding video to it. But there's things that we can't acquire uh, because it's either too big or... Uh, they don't want to be acquired. You know, can we power video for those types of things without buying it? And so then we started doing that. And we, we recently did that with a, uh, one of the larger dating companies in the world, um, the Match Group, for, for an app called Plenty of Fish, which, which we um, um, have a trial ag agreement at the moment to power. And so um, we've, you know, we, we've been kind of taking this video thing and, and just continuing to extend it in, in new directions. So explain what does what do you mean by power video? So by power video, I mean just um, what video is 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 basically a tab where you can meet uh, a tab of an application where uh, when you tap into that tab, you can see everyone else who's streaming right now, um, and then you can tap into those streams. You can you can ask questions, you can give gifts, you can comment. Um, it's doing that for apps we don't own. And so by power, I mean we supply. Um, all of the technology, we supply all of the moderation, we supply all of the talent management, 
Um, and in, in some cases, we even supply the streamers. So, so we, like, we combine behind the scenes the streamers and the viewers so that it's, it's one big pool. And, um, and that, that's pretty successful. That's been a successful model so far. So with all of what you've done, what's next for you? Um, well, you know, I, we, we've recently uh, entered into agreement. It's not done. Um, it's not closed. It's, we, we, uh, in March, we, we agreed to sell the company for $500 million to a company that powers, uh, that's the company behind uh, eHarmony and Parship, two uh, pretty significant uh, in, international uh, dating brands. And um, I expect that I'll continue to run the Meek Group as part of this larger thing. Um, and that we'll continue to uh, bring live streaming video to all sorts of apps, not necessarily just dating where we've been mostly focused, but potentially extending that um, into other group areas like gaming. Tell me, you were a writer. That's, I don't know what your major was at Harvard, but you, you started because you were good at content and writing, right? That's correct. Where did you learn app creation, live streaming, pulling it all together? Because I think many times what limits people in their thought process is, but I don't have that skill. You obviously were not stopped by that. So how did you go out and acquire what you needed to know? Sure. So, um, you know, I think I tend to be just naturally curious. So, so I, I don't expect to be able to do the tech. I'm, I'm not a technical uh, person. I, I don't do the development or the engineering. But um, what I am able to do is um, specify a product and have a vision for it. So I could say, you know, I think this idea that I may have seen elsewhere applied to some other industry with a small tweak could work in the dating landscape. And so it turned out that what I you know, provided in terms of value is uh, really value as an entrepreneur. So seeing opportunities that aren't yet realized and then uh, leading a group of people to go realize them. And that doesn't need, you don't need to be a specialist um, in order to do that. You could be, I mean, there's certainly plenty of entrepreneurs are specialists, um, but you could also just, um, uh, be good at a lot of different things. And, and, and I would say I'm probably more of that ilk where I'll spend most of my time worrying about product, trying to make sure we're giving the right users, uh, the right product to, the, to, to our users. Um, but, you know, I can understand project management, you know, I can understand finance, you know, um, not to the level of the people who work for me, but, you know, enough. Um, and that's all you basically have to do if you have talented people around you. So in the process of doing the things that you've done, biggest mistake you ever made, what would that be? Yeah, the biggest mistake I've ever made. Boy, that's a, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, and I imagine it would have to be business related. Let's see. You know, I, uh, there was a, a recent failure for one of our apps um, and it was, you know, sad in me because I, I really love the idea and thought of it. Um, but, um, and it was an app called uh, PodCoin where um, you could actually listen to podcasts and earn some virtual currency. Um, but, uh, you know, it ran um, uh, after, you know, uh, running for a while, um, there's certain rules, um, in the um, uh, store guidelines, you know, that, uh, you know, you can't incent, um, well, well, you know, or at least we're interpreted to say you can't incent uh, audio minutes. And so, you know, that I wouldn't, it's hard to say that that's necessarily a failure because there's no, no real way of knowing that. Um, and there was no way at the time of knowing it. Um, but it, it is, it is, you know, one of the more recent uh, failures. M most of the app ideas, um, I've ever had have, have failed. You know, I, I've probably started a dozen or so app ideas that have, have all uh, been shut down, PodCoin only being the most recent. Um, the, so, so, but I, you know, I, if it's a failure you learn from or, or you know, it doesn't really 
count. And so, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say, I would probably say that that was probably the biggest, but again, that wasn't all that big, you know, in the scheme of things. Got it. So Jeff, as you see people starting things, if you have a friend who's starting a new idea or getting going on with a business advice you give, what's the most important advice you give? Yeah. I mean, uh, there's a lot of advice probably to potentially give yeah, begin, you know, always be beginning is, is kind of a, you know, if you think you're successful, then it's time to begin something else. Um, if you, if you just failed, well, that's a good time to begin something else, right? <laughs> because uh, any success is short lived. And so it's live streaming today. It'll be something else tomorrow, right? Like that's the, just the nature of the business. You have to constantly be changing. And so, you know, you can't be an entrepreneur if you're not embracing change, right? And, and it, if you don't even, you have to not only embrace the change, you have to like want the change, you have to enjoy it, um, you know, because, you know, that's, that's, that's how it goes. Um, you know, I think another thing I try to deal with, you know, because you deal with a lot of ambiguity as an entrepreneur, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of problems where uh, you don't know if something is going to work out one way and be devastating or work out another way and be okay or work out still another way and be great. And then you might have four or five of those balls in the air. Um, and so, you know, I, I try to maintain um, this kind of, you know, do no harm view. Like f I, I've said it before as fight harmlessly, right? So like you can have a tough negotiation with someone, um, but you don't have to make it personal um, they might, but you know, you, you can do whatever you can to, to just fight harmlessly. Like, look, I'm interested in a fair deal. This is what I need, um, for it to be fair. This is, tell me why you need this. Like it doesn't have to become, um, and I would say as I was younger, I was more frequently, you know, more, yeah, you know, I'd be more angry in a negotiation like that. Uh, to the point where, you know, like hanging up on each other, but then still maybe finding a deal. Um, now I, I, I basically have, I think said, you know, just a lot, there's so much going on. There's so many different types of people. Yeah. Uh, everyone's going through their own thing. Um, you know, can you, can you, you have to fight? Yes, but you can do so in kind of a harmless way. Um, and then I would say, you know, there's a mental health aspect to a lot of this. You know, I think, you know, as, um, uh, as you grow your company, you, you know, there's often, and a lot of entrepreneurs go through various problems where you know, they, they feel like they have no one. I, I fortunately have had, um, you know, a, a strong family support system. Um, but there'll be lots of dark moments, um, in the midst of, you know, a business, especially one that's, uh, 10 years, 20 years long, you know, and, and in those dark moments, you have to be willing to accept that, uh, you know, you almost have to enjoy it, right? Like, because you, you'll have the, the, you know, the, the moment where the short sellers, I, I run a public company, the short sellers are attacking you or there's some concern or there's some media problem. Um, and the best you can do is try to be fair and relatively clear um, with people and try to understand what happened um, and realize that other people make their bones by, um, trying to bring you down. And so, you know, I think it's kind of this clarity of understanding that's the way the world works. And that's the, really the only way you're going to be able to bring your business into the world is by worrying about all of these details, but ultimately not letting it try to, you know, get at your, your underlying mental state. Like at the end of the day, you know, things are, th things that are going to happen are going to happen. Um, so, you know, I think, I think those are, you know, some of the things I would, I'd give. Wow. So Jeff, we have been on the phone for almost half an hour. What other thoughts do you have that you want to leave to with our listeners today before we close? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, uh, you know, the, and I understand you know, your listeners, I, I believe, are, are interested in, in, in legacy and things of, of this nature. Um, you know, I think um, you know the the best way is is really just to to begin. Like I, I've been 
thinking quite a bit, like what, you know, having recently entered an agreement to sell the company, like what is the legacy here? Obviously, I'd like to continue to, to be a part of it, but, but you know, what is the legacy? And, um, you know, I think we have a lot of time right now, a lot, at least a lot of people do, kind of um, isolated in their houses, uh, apartments. And, you know, now is as good a time as any to maybe put to, to paper um, what what some of those things because one way of leaving legacy is to to leave a book you know you could write a book now um another is to create a business um and um uh, and, and spend this time that we we have you know trying to to create something i would say that the virus has probably um uh, shortened the timeline by which i think about goals both business and professionally so rather than you know, if I have 10 things I might want to do, obviously you can't do those 10 things. You have to pick two or three of them. And so how do you pick those two or three? Um, I, now I've started to think more of, well, what, which of these will I, you know, matter to the next six months, matter, you know, matter the next, you know, few months, not necessarily matter, you know, two or three years from now. Like there's so much uncertainty right now that thinking through that is probably not even useful. Um, and so I've kind of shortened timeframes for everything we're building on the product side to even personal goals and say, like, look, that's great. That might be nice to have in five years, but that's irrelevant <laughs> right now. <laughs> this is not normal times. You know, what will I wish I've produced on the other side of this pandemic? Um, and so, uh, you know, I think, I think shortening timeframes and being thoughtful about, you know, what, what you want to have left as this mark on the other side of this um, virus is, is, um, is, is maybe something helpful. What makes you want to wake up in the morning and get to work and do what you do? There's a passion you have somewhere. Yeah, I would say um, it's probably a lot to do with wanting to create something new um, or wanting to see something I've thought of be born, right? And so... Um, both of those are the things that excite me the most. Um, certainly uh, my family as well. Um, you know, uh, three small children and uh, my wife. And, and that, 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 of course, is, is important as well. But I would say professionally, um, the, the desire to, to create something new. I'm definitely enjoying a, a good day is a day in which, you know, I had, I, I could write, you know, if I could write something on the side, I, I do write on the side. Um, or uh, had an idea for something that I think could become come to fruition, or I've seen progress against an idea I already had. You know, it's so interesting to hear different perspectives. Yours is, uh, and your journey is such an interesting one, because you've you've taken a route that's not typical of a lot of people in the business world. Mo a lot of entrepreneurs will have come out of a a very um, typical business world, and but you've created your own path along the way. So you've you've had incredible stamina. You've also had an, a, a, an amazing ability to know what you want, which um, I think is so important. A lot of times, I think we don't know what we want, and so we flounder a bit. Yeah, you know, I think there's something to that. I, I think. Um something that you don't necessarily learn in a business class is, you know, these ideas and, and companies are often just a reflection of the entrepreneur's inward nature, right? So uh, an idea kind of by its nature comes out of the inwardness of a particular person and, you know, enriching that inwardness through reading um, through varied, um, uh, you know, opportunities and, and, and not necessarily just being all business. Uh, I, I actually don't, basically don't read business books. I, I, I read all sorts of stuff, but not that. Um, but I think, you know, you can get an idea um, from any, you can get ideas to apply to business from poetry. You can get ideas to apply to business from, you know, the conquistadors or like there's, there's any from philosophy, from fiction, um, you know, having 
you know, you're probably not going to get those. Everybody having the same ideas is not going to lead to a great idea, period. And so, you know, how do you enrich your inward nature in order to be looking for an idea and in order to encapsulate enough other concepts to create that idea when it's needed? And so there's obviously a mystery that lays at the heart of all of that. Um, And so that's, I mean, I, I look at it as more of a kind of this inward nature. Like it's not, building a company is not just about team and technology and ideas. Like, the, of course, those things matter. But it's really enriching the inwardness of the person who brought it into existence. Because someone without some natural capability or some, something that shows to somebody else is not going to be able to recruit a talented team around them. Um, and you know, those people are going to have to see something. They're going to have to see somebody who has a goal that's worth pursuing and that has a chance of pursuing it. And so, um, you know, when you, people talk about culture, it's often just a reflection of the entrepreneur's personality, uh, warts and all. And so, you know, I think there's this aspect that of, of, of just inwardness that um, people just don't appreciate as it relates to, to business. And you know, you might be able to develop that in a business school class, but um, you probably just learn a lot of how to's and you don't really learn the kernel. That note, Jeff, thank you so much for your time and for being with us today. It's been wonderful to learn about your journey and also just the sharing that you've done in terms of what you've learned as an entrepreneur. And those of you who are listening to us today, thank you for being with us on Building My Legacy podcast. Oh, thank you. You've been listening to Building My Legacy podcast with Dr. Lois Sonstegard. To book your appointment with Dr. Sonstegard, visit www.buildtomorrow.com.